Authorities say the godfather, Aldolfo Constanzo, and one of his bodyguards was shot and killed. But according to a Mexican newspaper, Constanzo was killed by his girlfriend, Sarah Aldrete, just moments before a shootout with scores of police. Authorities say Aldrete is considered a voodoo witch. Aldolfo Constanzo is the leader of one of Mexico's most infamous death cults, a group that was responsible for taking the lives of 17 individuals, with an additional nine more suspected. Constanzo's story involves a twisted blend of cartel dealings, ritualistic sacrifices, and believed witchcraft in the name of the religion Palo Mayombe. Adolfo's mother was a 15-year-old Cuban immigrant who would eventually parent three children by three different fathers. His mother would move to San Juan, Puerto Rico after her first husband passed, remarrying once again while there. Spirituality was a major part of Adolfo's childhood, and although raised Catholic and a participating altar boy, he had the opportunity to accompany his mother on trips to Haiti and learn about voodoo where the two are often practiced simultaneously by residents. Adolfo and his family would return to Miami during the year of 1972, with a 10-year-old Adolfo now dealing with the death of his stepfather. Although the cause of Delia's husband's deaths are unknown, it does seem suspicious that two of her husbands would both die from mysterious circumstances in just a 10-year window. No matter the reason, the death of her second husband left the family with a healthy sum and the ability to move into a middle-class, residential neighborhood. Despite the influx of money, neighbors still suspected Adolfo's mother of being a Santeria priest and conducting frequent, ritualistic animal sacrifices. Florida's Cuban population caused what I'd like to call a Santeria panic in the 1970s, where residents struggled to understand the practice and stories flooded local newspapers surrounding the mysterious faith. Reports of animals coming in were almost daily. Ground crews reported to stumble across decapitated goats, chickens, money, candles, and even dolls with pins stuck in them. There was even one story where the mangled carcass of a goat was found lying in the street beneath a judge's courthouse window. It's apparent that his childhood experiences had a profound impact on Adolfo, as he would become apprentice to a local sorcerer of a religion called Palo Mayombe. Many of its practitioners originated from eastern Cuba and also practiced Santeria in conjunction. Adolfo's mother Delia would remarry for the third time to a man of Cuban descent, who was both an alleged drug dealer and an avid practitioner of Palo Mayombe. From an early age, both Adolfo and his mother would be arrested multiple times for shoplifting and petty theft. Rumors swirled of the Constanzo house being kept in decrepit conditions, with walls reportedly splattered with blood due to the frequent animal sacrifice. In fact, some sources claim that Delia Gonzalez was arrested for keeping 27 animals in her tiny apartment with the floors covered in feces and blood. Now only 14 years old, Adolfo impregnated his 13-year-old girlfriend and decided to drop out of school. It was also around this point that he began to claim to have out-of-body experiences, the ability to heal the sick, and the ability to predict the future. And judging from old newspaper interviews with Adolfo's mother, it seems that she held in firm belief that he had some form of clairvoyance. She claimed that Adolfo predicted President Reagan would be shot in 1980, but survive. I suppose a year away might be considered impressive, but with Adolfo's mother giving the interview during 89, it seems more coincidental than anything. The next prediction that his mother recounted was that Adolfo predicted a great tragedy was coming to Mexico just months before the Mexico City earthquake of 1985. 
maybe he was referring to himself. Dolfo would first visit Mexico City around late 1983, supporting himself as a tarot card reader. It was there that he recruited two younger men, Martin Quintana and Omar Orea, before briefly returning back to Miami. While back in Miami, Adolfo is believed to have completed his religious training in Palo Mayambe and had a ceremonial tattoo carved into his right shoulder. Some sources falsely claim that he had scratched out two sentences, while actual evidence appears to be a combination of arrows and crosses. Further research indicates that this tattoo likely signified one of two symbols from the Palo Mayambe religion, likely either Ogun or Oshoshi. Ogun and Ashoshi are spirits who appear across several African religions, originally spawning from the Yoruba people. Both spirits involve elements of ritual sacrifice, traditionally involving goats, chickens, and other game animals. Ogun is referred to as the god of iron, while Ashoshi is known as the god of the hunt. Many of the rituals in Santeria and Palomayambe involve the summoning of these spirits to aid supposed requests in the real world. After returning to Mexico City in late 1984, he would recruit another follower, Jorge Montes. Constanzo would use his three followers as lovers, servants, and as proto-salesmen for his paid rituals. Constanzo continued to live wild and freely while in Mexico, fathering another child while also keeping Omar as the Lady of Constanzo and Martin as the Man of Constanzo. Adolfo was apparently able to find work as a model and frequented the city's infamous gay district, Zona Rosa. Now living and working in Mexico City, Constanzo had established himself as a purveyor of ritualistic cleansings, with some of his recovered journals claiming to have earned up to 4,500 for a single ceremony. Adolfo had established a morbid menu of sorts, with the prices happily paid by superstitious and wealthy gang members, looking to provide extra protection to their upcoming drug shipments and assassination attempts. A rooster would be $6, a goat, $30, a boa constrictor, $450, an adult zebra would be $1,100, and an African lion cub would be $3,100. One specific story from his journals recounts the drug dealer paying Constanzo $40,000 over a period of three years for his rituals. Yet it wasn't only the criminal underworld that was enthralled by his work. His circle of clients and followers included doctors, real estate agents, and even four members of the Mexico City Police. Salvador Vidal Garcia was in fact a federal judicial police officer and a member of the Narcotics Task Force. Although he met Aldolfo in 1985, he would be later found guilty in 1989 for unrelated drug trafficking charges. Florentino Ventura was another one of those four officers, and was actually the chief of Mexico's division of Interpol. As far as crooked officials go, Ventura might as well have been the poster boy. Ventura was in fact one of the interrogating officers of one of Mexico's most infamous drug traffickers, Rafael Caro Quintero. Ventura's story would come to its own gruesome and puzzling conclusion, but more on that later. Ventura would be the cog that connected Adolfo to the wealthy and powerful Calzaldo family in 1986, at the time one of Mexico's most dominant drug cartels. Adolfo's followers viewed him as a legitimate deity, and were absolutely convinced of his abilities. Adolfo's charm and wit won over the family, and it wasn't long before he was able to buy his own condo and a fleet of luxury cars, including an $80,000 brand new Mercedes-Benz. His ability to deceive was borderline mythical, and his scams weren't just limited to the spiritual world. Another account arose of Adolfo using his police connections to pose as a drug enforcement officer, confiscating a massive bounty of cocaine that he eventually flipped for 100000 Constanzo's followers would later claim that his renown attracted the services of various Mexican celebrities, including the following. All three would deny any connection to the cult when later asked in 1989 when Adolfo's story reached international headlines. For all of his supposed influence, Adolfo's infatuation with joining the Calzada cartel was ultimately rejected in April of 1987. The slick-talking Cuban-American was still considered an outsider to the closed circle of Mexican traffickers, and it seemed to strike a particular nerve. How exactly he achieved his revenge is unknown, but no matter the circumstances, Guillermo, Calzada, Sanchez, and six of his family members went missing on April 30th, 1987, 
On May 1st, police noted that the Calzada office had been disturbed with only the presence of melted candles and what appears to have been the aftermath of a religious ceremony. On May 7, 1987, seven bodies were exhumed and recovered from Lake Zampango over the duration of a week. All of the bodies showed clear signs of mutilation of the victim's appendages, organs, and genitals. Investigating officers were horrified and didn't have a fraction of a clue as to what the explanation may be. Little did authorities know that at the time, Adolfo had used the Calzada cartel as totems in his Palomayambe rituals, believed to be a more powerful replacement than the use of animal bones, specifically when building the Nganga vessel, which was required to be fed with a sacrifice of blood and bones. Adolfo continued to press onto his police contacts to introduce him to more wealthy clients. By July 1987, the previously mentioned Salvador Garcia connected him to Elio and Ovidio Hernandez. The brothers were a pair of relatively new drug traffickers that operated closer to the Matamoros region. It is believed that Adolfo worked up an agreement with the Hernandez brothers that the cult would earn a 50% stake of the brothers' profits in exchange for spiritual protection. It's at this point of the story that we introduce a key figure and the eventual second in command of the cult. Sarah Aldrete. According to Aldrete's own memoir, the two met in Matamoros after Aldrete accidentally almost collided with Aldolfo's Buick Grand Marquis. She would later find out that Constanzo had spotted her at some point earlier in the day and had started tailing her until he had the chance to talk. Aldrete was Mexican-born but attended high school in Brownsville, Texas, later attending Texas Southmost College for a physical education degree. By all accounts of her classmates and teachers, she was incredibly kind and well-mannered. When she first encountered Adolfo, she immediately recognized his necklace and wear as someone who practices Santeria and was coincidentally studying the topic as a point of personal interest. Although she was intimidated over his approach, she seemed to swoon over his charm and wit. It also didn't seem to matter that Sarah had a boyfriend at the time, a Brownsville drug smuggler named Gilberto Sosa. Given the nature of cities near the border, both Brownsville, Texas and Matamoros, Mexico were hotspots for smuggling and trafficking. Even to this day, it remains a key funneling point of illegal activities. Sarah's personal life seemed to develop along this parallel. To her friends and classmates in Brownsville, she was bright, helpful, and hoping to transfer to university. However, the ones that truly knew Sarah in Matamoros understood that she was fascinated with the occult and possessed her own brand of devilish charm, providing a shade of faux innocence over the evil she would carry out. It seemed that the bond that Adolfo had over Aldrete was enough to convince her to devote herself to him completely. In a show of either cruelness or kindness, Adolfo placed an anonymous call to her boyfriend at the time to let him know of Sarah's infidelity. In traditional cult behavior, leaders will work to isolate their followers from the ones they love, leaving them little to no choice. Sarah would embrace her place as the head witch of the cult while still attending school at Texas Southmost College. During the same year she was named to the school's dean list, she was assisting in sadistic Palomayambe rituals with Adolfo, consisting now of human organs instead of just animal remains. She managed to hold both sides of her life relatively separate, except for a minor incident later noted by her classmates. According to her classmates, one of the rare nights that they spent time with Sarah socially was an occasion where they were drinking on campus at one of the students' dorm rooms. After a few drinks, she convinced the group to watch the recently released 1987 thriller film starring Martin Sheen, The Believers. The film was mildly received at the time and was criticized for sensationalizing Santa Rita practices during a time that America was rampant with satanic panic. Despite the Hollywood spin, some very real elements from Adolfo's practice can be seen in the movie. Adolfo was said to often wear a chain of Chango, otherwise known as Santa Barbara Bendita. These are remnants of an Nganga. A Santeria prayer shop, a common sight in both Miami and Cuba. 
Adolfo was known for using cigar smoke in his rituals, and some stories from Aldrete include the incorporation of cigar ash into open wounds. After Sarah showed her classmates the movie, she eagerly talked about the elements of Santeria and opened up with giddy excitement over the ritual items she had in her possession. Although it was just a brief view, her classmates were given a peek into the secret life of Autorete and a hint of the horrors that would be unearthed just years later. Through interviews conducted with former members of the cult, it is clear that Sarah had an obsession with the movie and felt it was prophetic in nature. In her place as the godmother of the group, she forced members to watch the movie countless times. She did this so often that the media dubbed the group the Believers when the story initially broke. The group would reach a new level of depravity when Adolfo made the decision to move them to a plot of desert 20 miles from Matamoros, Rancho Santa Elena. On May 28, 1988, drug dealer Hector de la Fuente and farmer Moises Castillo were both visiting the site for reasons unknown. All that is truly known is that both were gunned down and later dismembered in the name of ritual sacrifice. Their spree would continue in Mexico City, where he ordered his minions to kidnap a drag queen named Ramon Paz Escobar as retribution for an argument with Adolfo. Ramon threatened to break a bottle over the head of Adolfo, and Adolfo exacted revenge by having La Claudia dismembered and disposed of by Martin Quintana. During June 1988, Adolfo was continuing his trafficking efforts and set his sights on a $20 million shipment in Houston, Texas. The only problem is that police were already wise to his efforts and were planning to intercept the shipment. The group would narrowly escape capture, but left behind a Palo Mayambe altar in a panic to evade authorities. On August 12, 1988, Ovidio Hernandez and his two-year-old son were kidnapped by a rival trafficking clan. Adolfo retaliated by committing a human sacrifice of an unknown victim in order to push for his release. What actually brought home Ovidio is unknown, but he would return unharmed the next day with his son. Escudero would issue a public statement on September 5, 1988, saying that God will punish all those involved in my detention and defamation. By September 17th, news broke of an incident involving Ventura and his wife. The official story was that Ventura was drunk while at dinner with an apparent friend, Enrique Orozco, and both of their wives. After dinner, he got into an argument with his wife while in his car, and in the same round of gunfire, he took the lives of his wife, Enrique's wife, and eventually, his own. Holes were poked into the story left and right, including the fact that the waitresses working at the restaurant claimed that Ventura didn't have anything to drink there, and they didn't recognize Orozco when questioned. Aside from that, the probability of the gunshots coming from the rear passenger seat seems far more likely given the fact that both of the women in Ventura were killed in a single burst. Whether out of disregard or preoccupation with finding his next sacrifice, Adolfo hardly batted an eyelid over the incident. The Godfather was increasingly bloodthirsty and nothing could sway his attention. It was November 1988 when the strangely principled Adolfo decided to punish his disciple Jorge Gomez for using cocaine. Although the cult smuggled cocaine and cannabis in massive amounts, the use of drugs was forbidden by Constanzo. Adolfo's reign over the group took a far more sinister turn as he seemingly grew more bloodthirsty and senseless with his decisions. He would sacrifice three more drug dealers over the span of January to March 1989 before convincing Ovidio Hernandez to lure his own 14-year-old cousin, the only known child victim of the cult. On March 13, 1989, Adolfo found himself with another still unidentified victim. He had ultimately disappointed with the ritual as he felt the victim had accepted his fate too early. It 
was at this point that the enraged Adolfo demanded his followers enter town and grab him an Anglo for his next ritual. It was here when the worlds of Adolfo Constanzo and Mark Kilroy would collide, leaving both changed forever. Unlike his usual victims of drug dealers, prostitutes, and criminals, Kilroy was an American college student coming from a wealthy family. His disappearance made national headlines in the U.S. and even roped in former President George Bush Sr. Kilroy and three of his friends from university were in the area for spring break and frequently walked across the border to visit bars and nightlife in Matamoros. As their night was winding down on Monday, March 13th, 1989, they were outside of a rebranded Hard Rock Cafe, catered for Americans partying across the border. It was said that Mark and his friends were setting off back to their car across the border when a man motioned to Mark and said something along the lines of, didn't I just see you somewhere? His friends backtracked briefly to look for Mark after this interaction, but assumed he was hitching a ride across with someone he knew. When they woke up the following morning and still hadn't heard from him, they knew something was wrong. Little did they know that Kilroy was abducted by one of Mexico's most brutal cult leaders, Adolfo Constanzo. Authorities would later find out that Kilroy had attempted an escape, but was ultimately unsuccessful. While the search for Kilroy intensified in the US, Constanzo would claim two more victims for protective rituals. This included Aldrete's ex-boyfriend, Gilberto Sosa and an ex-cop turned smuggler, Victor Saucedo. During this period, Mexican authorities were erecting roadblocks across countless border districts in an attempt to deter trafficking, and Adolfo felt that the group needed extra protection. The followers' belief in Adolfo seemed to warp their interpretation of reality completely, and on April 9th, 1989, members Serafin Hernandez, Sergio Martinez, and David Valdez blasted through a police roadblock outside Matamoros. The three believed that Adolfo's protection had made them invisible, and when captured, they even believed that they'd be impervious to bullets. Serafin was just 20 years old at the time, and was the nephew of Constanzo's close associate, Elio Hernandez. His brashness would only tip off authorities more, who demanded to follow Serafin to his destination, Rancho Santa Elena. As fate would have it, Elio was at the ranch at the time, and had no idea of the approaching police. Police conducted a preliminary search of the ranch and found 70 pounds of cannabis and a large stash of weapons, initially stopping the search there. Once all four cult members were rounded up and brought back to the police station, details of the group's black magic masses were finally unearthed during closed door interrogations. Police stormed the ranch the next day with a massive search team, with no idea what to expect. They apparently showed a maintenance worker on the ranch a picture of Mark Kilroy and he only gestured towards the ritual shed. In the shed itself, police found the dismembered remains of Kilroy and two Mexican federal police. When they asked Serafin where the other bodies on the ranch were, he reportedly said, which ones? Both him and the other members in custody were quick to give up the exact site of Adolfo's graveyard. In total, authorities collected the remains of 15 individuals. Given the timeline of the group only moving to the site roughly a year and a half ago, it is likely that more victims exist than just this one site. Based on the testimonies given and evidence discovered, arrest warrants were issued for Adolfo Costanzo and Sarah Aldrete. Searches conducted at Aldrete's room in her family home revealed a makeshift altar and blood splatter stains near the wall. Police raided Constanzo's luxury home in Atizapan on April 17, 1989, and found a hidden ritual chamber on the grounds with no sign of either Constanzo or Aldrete. The discovery of Kilroy had caused a firestorm in the media, and the question on everyone's mind was where is Adolfo Constanzo? Rumors swirled that Adolfo had gotten as far as Chicago and was believed to be with his inner circle of followers. The search for Adolfo took on a supernatural twist as investigators decided to burn down Adolfo's ritual shed and place a wooden cross on the ashes. According to a witness, a photographer from the Brownsville Herald, a purification rite was performed by a curandero to combat Adolfo's evil spirits. 
Meanwhile, in Mexico City, Constanzo, Aldrete, Quintana, Ochoa, and three more cult followers were held up in an apartment, likely biding their time in deciding a proper plan of escape, or retaliation. It is said that Aldrete attempted to write a note and pass it out the window, describing that she was the only girl hiding with the wanted cult leader and was fearing for her own life. Of course, this anecdote is impossible to confirm and remains one of the ongoing points of defense that Aldrete claims, which ultimately crumbles under scrutiny. It's likely that their time crammed up in the apartment started to cause cabin fever, and tempers started to flare. On May 2nd, 1989, police were called to the apartment complex with reports of an argument and the sound of gunfire. Adolfo heard the approaching police and mania set in. By the account of cultist Alvaro de Leon Valdez, he went crazy crazy and begun to throw wads of money out of the window in a last act of defiance. Unable to cope with the idea of capture, he ordered Valdez to take the lives of himself and Martin Quintana, opting for the Uzi submachine gun that they had on hand. Upon her capture, Aldrete would claim to have known nothing of the killings and only found out through the newspapers. She maintains that her role in the cult was minimal and that she was a victim herself. She also claims that during the interrogation process, she was sexually assaulted by Mexican authorities. She was charged six years in 1990 for criminal association, but after a second trial was found guilty of the killings committed at Rancho Santa Elena, earning another 30 years to her sentence. Cult member Omar Orea Ochoa also claimed ignorance to the killings, but was given a life sentence in prison nonetheless. Omar was actually diagnosed with AIDS while in the prison's health system, and would pass away just a few years later after the August 1989 diagnosis. The remaining known cult members were handed heavy sentences for their believed participation in the killings and rituals. The reach of Adolfo's group was ultimately unknown, and some theorize that practitioners of his twisted brand of Palomayambe still exist. As luck would have it, Adolfo's mom was arrested and sent to jail herself just a few months after her son's ordeal for stealing a refrigerator from a home she was working at. She claimed to have no knowledge of her son's activities, and that she had even visited him earlier that year. Adolfo's story parallels that of many cults, yet is unique in the way of being one of Mexico's only true cult leaders. He was full of charisma and mystique, yet his interpretation of Palomayambe became undeniably sadistic and psychopathic. To some, he was known as El Padrino, or the Godfather. The American media later dubbed him the Witch Doctor of Matamoros. By any name, he was pure evil. <laughs>